Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Chai Time with yours truly, Marwan Arani, also known as the Shaggy Chef. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've taken this thing about to 11. I mean, this is, this is reaching critical mass at some point. I got my haircut appointment next uh, Sunday, so this may be the last episode. Maybe one more episode with the Shaggy Chef. But we'll definitely keep going with the Welsh Shorn Chef afterwards. Check Funny Mom at the helm. Hey, guys. Um, ooh. Ooh, ooh. Vish is there to watch your last Shaggy last Chef shaggy episode. Chef. We gotta re-up yep. on some chai. Wash the long pour. <laughs> yes. Why the long pour? Because it gets frothy. Mmm, delicious. Yum, yum, yum. Alrighty. Mmm, that's delicious. Mint and ginger. Okay, I'm gonna move real fast today because this is an amazing dish, but I'm literally doing the whole thing from scratch for your benefit. Um, so the dish we're making is Colmino Patio, uh, aka Shrimp Patia. And Patia literally is sort of a tomato-y ragu. Um, this dish is a Parsi dish. It's beloved in my house. Uh, people that know it, know it. And the defining characteristics of the flavor profile is any kind of seafood, in this case shrimp, in sort of a tangy, sweet, tomato-y, um, cilantro-y um, sort of ragu almost, if you will. Um, it's not too saucy, it's not too thick, it's a little bit in between, and it's absolutely freaking delicious. Okay, enough description, we'll describe more as we go, but let's get this thing going. First things first, I got oil in my pot. Um, I'm using a nice wide lodge Dutch oven here because it's got a white pot, but it still can fill up with the liquid as we do it. And I'm gonna go ahead and put in two cuts of diced red onion. So, let's start that first because this will take forever. Oh yes. Oh, you can hear the sizzle. Um, it's probably more like two and a half cups, and it's about two medium-sized red onions. If you don't have red onions, use white onions. It's okay. I like red onions for this dish because the red onions have a little bit of uh, a little bit more of zinc going with it, which I kind of want in this dish. All right, that's in. Chai Penny Mom, any preferences on which? Oh, here we go. Uh, let's do this guy. Let's do this one. Which spoon are we going to forever ruin? Sure. I think this one hasn't got much too much strain. Okay, that's in the oil. Ah. I do this sometimes unconsciously without talking about it, but my mother-in-law, Ross Tubman, <laughs> a phenomenal chef and pastry chef in her own right, texted me last time and said, don't forget to tell the viewers to salt the onions. Here's Let's to your mom. Here's <laughs> to your mom. And don't worry, he is getting a haircut. <laughs> Some salt of the onions. Why do we salt the onions? It helps them sweat. Uh, the salt pulls the water out and they just cook a little bit faster. And also, like I explained in my last episode, I like salting as I go. And we'll talk more about that. Okay, boom, that's it. All righty. Um, so what are the ingredients to make this dish? As you can see, onions, uh, tomatoes, and this time I am using actual tomatoes, not the pureed canned tomatoes. You guys heard me wax poetic about the uh, pros of using crushed canned tomatoes, especially high quality ones. But in this dish, I actually want the tomatoes to be a little bit chunky, still have a little bit of body, kind of have that um, almost ragu-like flavor. But look for ripe tomatoes. I know it's hard this time of the year, but still um, look for the right ones. So. Yeah, yeah, there's already plenty of tomatoes. People like the little knife work demo while we're um, cooking. And also get to show off how sharp my knives is. Don't worry about the cut on these. We're chopping them up roughly because we're basically just mashing it up and it can go in tomatoes and all. So if you have ripe tomatoes and you're smashing them up, that's where they go, ah, almost put them in there. That's what they're gonna look like, okay? All right, what else do we have? Lots and lots of fresh cilantro. Uh, tamarind, which will give us that katta mitta taste, uh, that sweet and sour taste. If you don't have tamarind, don't worry about it. We'll use lime and we'll sweeten it a little bit something else. Uh, garlic, one wilted um, jalapeno. I think I'm becoming famous for my wilted vegetables. I know. <laughs> but this is that. This is pandemic vegetables. This is pandemic you, vegetables. You work with what work you got. With what you got. And um, some spices. And really, the spices are very simple. We've got some red chilies. And I've got three regular red chilies and one Kashmir chili. And again, don't worry about the Kashmir chili. If all you have are dried red chilies, that's fine. And about two cumin, uh, teaspoons of cumin seeds. And also um, the Kashmir chili powder, the turmeric, and what was this? Oh, cumin seeds, you already saw that. Okay. Janet Files would like to know, where do you find tamarind? Uh, we will talk about any Asian grocery store and we'll get to the tamarind in just a second, uh, Janet. So you're gonna have to stay around. I'm gonna toast these suckers real quick. In the pan, pan's already on. Remind me not to burn my hand when I take the pan off. <laughs> Onions are going. Check on the bones and let me know if the, um, if the um, 
Spices are going to burn, Spices are right? burning. Okay, they're, they're burn, not burning right? yet. Not burning yet. Not burning yet. And literally, when you see them smoking a little bit and they darken in color, they're good to go. You guys, the smell of those toasted spices is Boom. so comforting. Done. The pan was hot. You can see the cumin seeds already darkening, and that's really all it needs. You know, I mean, don't overthink this, guys. Just uh, a little toast to release those fragrances. Remember, all this is going to hit some hot oil at some point anyways. What was in there that you put those So there was pots? garlic cloves in there. And the reason I have garlic cloves in there is because we're going to blend this all together. You guys saw me do the same thing with the, um, the uh, seafood curry, that I, the golden style curry that I did last time. Um, that was the grind and blend and make a masala paste technique. And we're going to do the same thing with this one. Alrighty, moving quickly, quickly. We're trying to beat the record here for how quickly <laughs> can I bang out an Indian dish with just some minimal prep done. Uh, let's get this in. Alrighty. These just literally need a second to cool. I mean, they God so almighty, good. they smell so good. And this is what I mean by the cumin slightly darkening mm. color. That's really all you need. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna put this in there. Try to save my spices. Okay. Boom, boom, Vish, boom. I will definitely cook you a dish. Oh man, Vish, Vish. <laughs> You've never asked me to cook you a dish. <laughs> a half a teaspoon of turmeric powder. In with this bad boy. Now, are you using less turmeric powder because it's this incredibly rich oh. diaspora turmeric, or are would you, you be using this? I am. Look at that beautiful turmeric. But would you use the same amount if it was just sort of a regular turmeric? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I use fresh and really high quality turmeric to begin with, so um, so it should. So that's about the right amount you should use if you have really good quality unadulterated turmeric. If you just have regular straw-brought turmeric, I mean, if it looks really bright orange and has that amazing turmeric smell right off the bat, then use how much I did. If the turmeric doesn't smell like much and you can't get all those, you know, that smell from it, then a little bit more. But turmeric's pretty potent, so you don't want to go crazy with it, okay? All right, onions are going. Um, let's get this masala going. Hang on a second. Before the masala, before the masala, let's do one more step. What are we cooking our, our uh, patio with? We're cooking with shrimpies. So let's, before we do anything else, hit the shrimpy with my dry brine that you guys have heard me talk about. I mean, that's not what an Indian would call it, but it kind of helps explain the point. A little bit of salt and a little bit of Kashmir chili powder. Talking about just a pinch. I mean, we're just dusting. Dusting. And a little bit of um, turmeric. If somebody's saying how much is a little bit, I mean, quarter teaspoon give or take. We're not trying to add a lot of spices to this dish. We're doing this to essentially give the uh, shrimp or the seafood a little bit of a dry rub, if you will, get those flavors going into the meat also, um, the protein, if you will, not just into the curry, so that when these things hit the curry, there already are like little flavor bombs going in. And we just let this sit aside. And this is a very common Indian technique with uh, meats, seafood of all kinds, poultry, we just give different kinds of rubs. Sometimes the rub's a little wet. It'll have some ginger garlic paste also, or maybe a little lime juice. Uh, but in this case, that's all we want. Voila. I feel like I want a little bit more salt. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna put that aside. All right, shrimp's done. Back to the grind. So this is not gonna grind up very well or blend up very well without a little bit of liquid. So we're just gonna put just enough water to get this to buzz and spin properly. How much? Probably a quarter cup. There, and that should do it. If it doesn't, you can always come back, add a little bit more water, and get going some more. Make sure this thing is tight. Okay, make sure we get it all in the bottom there. And because it really doesn't take that much for garlic to mush up, is that the seeds and the chilies in there, I want them to actually, you know, bust up and mix into the masala, not just be whole little seeds in there. And guys, I mean, again, <laughs> these people don't even know I exist, but the problem with a lot of Indian cuisine, well, not the problem, I think one of the 
One of the features of a lot of Indian cooking is that we like to make fresh masalas, like wet or dry masalas. And this is a perfect example of a quick wet masala. Um, I would highly recommend getting something small and simple and easy like a magic bullet um, because it's so, you, can, you don't, you're not washing an entire um, you know, food processor, an entire blender just to do a little bit of masala. Um, you can just bang this out, put it away, and don't worry if your wife complains that everything <laughs> in the house... It was supposed to be my smoothie maker. Let's just clarify why I'm complaining. So just keep a dedicated one of these keep a dedicated plastic these, containers right. for your spices. To answer any questions you may have about how much oil I use for about two cups of onions, I used about a quarter cup of oil, and again, I've talked about this a bazillion times, we're going to end up with, you know, roughly a gallon or so of this sauce. So a quarter cup of oil is going a really long way. Uh, but you want that oil so you can really get a good fry on your situation. Somebody had a good question about your spices. They noticed that you keep some of them in the plastic bags inside the tin in the spice well of spices. Can you clarify about yes. that? Yes. All of our spice well of spices, for the most part, come in little bags. And the reason we put them inside in the a tin, a inside bag a inside a tin. Inside yeah. the tin. And the reason we put them in little bags inside the tin is for two reasons. Number one, so that they're even as fresh during transit when they get to you. Number two, so they don't spill out of the tin a little bit and leak during transit, because some of the fine spices can escape the, you know, the edges of the tin. And number three is so they don't clump up in case they were exposed to moisture. But when I get home, I kind of like to pull them out of the bag and put them directly in the tin because it's easier to work with. Mm -hmm. Turmeric can get clumpy, so I keep it in, in the bag. That answers that. But cumin seeds don't, and they don't have to worry about them getting wet, so I keep them as the way it is. Okay, so what I did was I made two slits in the jalapeno or if you have a serrano, or if you have a regular green chili, like a bird's eye or Thai chili, and we're putting this in here. So what we're doing is we're letting the, um, some of the heat and the flavor from the chili seep into the oil and flavor the oil without a whole chili being there, without diced up chilies being in there. And at the end, we'll fish that chili out. Okay, this is frying away. And while that's doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and do my cilantro next. All right, so a little bit about this cuisine. Parsis um, are Persians, or Zoroastrian Persians, that fled Persia, as it was known back then, before it became known as Iran, around the 10th century, and fleeing religious persecution as Islam spread out of Arabia and into uh, more of the Middle East and made its way all the way to Persia and became the dominant religion. The Zoroastrians, which were the um, sort of pre-existing um, not just civilization, but uh, religion and culture at the time slowly got sort of pushed out and almost disappeared. But a handful of these Zoroastrians escaped the region of Persia known as Pars. Um, when I say escape, immigrate, that's, that's a better word, and made their way to India, arrived at the northwestern state of Gujarat, and they first arrived on a little island and then eventually made their way off that island to the small town called Urwada and established their fire temple there and, uh, and started a small community there. But they um, integrated with the local state and the local people, uh, the state of Gujarat, picked up the local language, and their cuisine today is a mishmash of both uh, Persian styles, um, Indian, specifically Gujarati cuisine, and because the Parsis also were very good businessmen, uh, they were merchants, if you will, and shipbuilders, and, and thrived under British uh, colonization, and adopted a lot of these sort of Anglo uh, cuisines, if you will, and habits, and, um, and incorporated that into their cooking too. So there's actually a Parish dish, Parsi dish known as Irish stew. Irish as in Irish, Ireland. Of course, we pronounce it Irish ishtu, but it's <laughs> essentially, you know, I can imagine, you know, Parsis experiencing any some of these English dishes and, or, or UK dishes and saying, well, nothing that a little masala, a little spice, a little, um, you know, chili powder won't fix. So many of the Parsi dishes seem to have almost an Anglo background to them. I mean, honestly, even this dish, I don't know what the actual origin of the dish is and, and how it came to be. I'm assuming it's the sweet and sour part comes from um, Iran and Persia because um, even a lot of Persian cuisine, that, that component is there usually through little sultanas and berries and whatnot. Um, obviously, all the chilies and spices they picked up from being in Gujarat and India for a long time. Uh, but the whole tomato, uh, an acid bit, I mean, it reminds me almost a little bit of uh, as if I'm making a, a tomato sauce, like almost like a marinara. Uh, except instead of basil, we got lots and lots of fresh cilantro, and then we got a little few extra components. So, 
that's kind of what we're doing today. And uh, this dish is going to be fantastic. Hey, Vish wants you to tell the story of the Canadian Parsi couple. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Vish is going to burn his food. He's not, he can't keep track of both <laughs> things. <laughs> As Chai Bonnie Mom knows, <laughs> you know, if I'm boiling an egg in this kitchen, in complete and utter silence, everybody leaves the room. No music, no sound, doors closed, nobody in my way. It's I true. have to focus on bag. Um, yeah, no, that was a fantastic story. So myself, my good friend Vish Butt, JBF, He's joining us today. JBF winning chef uh, for Best Chef Southeast for last year, as well as Chidi Kumar, another phenomenal chef who's made it to the finals of the Yay, JBF Awards Chidi. this year. Congratulations, Congrats. Chidi. Congrats. Traveled with me to India, and we um, went to that small little seaside town of Udwana, which is halfway between Gujarat and Mumbai, which is uh, to the south of Gujarat. So we stopped in this amazing little town, which almost was felt like a World Heritage Site because it was a perfectly preserved example of Parsi culture. Not many Parsis left in the world, about 50,000. I'm going to take a break. Here's what I'm doing. Okay. Now that the onions are starting to, to brown, I am adding in this masala in there, and this is where all of that wonderful flavor is going to come from. The heat, the chilies, the garlic, the cumin seed, and again, if you watched last week's um, Go and Curry, Go and Fish Curry, you saw the same technique employed. You probably see this, saw the same technique employed in Vandalu. And um, it's a great way to really build flavor. Um, and that's the water from the spice, you know, masala hitting the onions. That'll cook out in just a minute. And this stuff is so good, I'm actually gonna put just a touch more water in there and give it a rinse out and then pour it in there. Don't worry, the water part will evaporate. Now that your onions are fried, you don't have to worry about it too much. Yeah, so get all that fantastic good flavor. Stuff. Get all that good stuff. Don't waste any of it. And boom, in she goes. Okay, so we arrive in this little town, Upper Dwada. Like I said, it felt like a, a, a town stuck in time. Beautiful old Parsi homes. And this buildings. is where they first em and it was immigrated. Exactly. Mm -hmm. it was when they first immigrated, so when they bought their holy fire from, from uh, Persia with them, this is where they built their fire temple, and this is where the um, Atush Behram, the first sort of fire temple of all Parsis in India is. It's sort of as if the Olympic flame was preserved all the way from ancient times and kept burning in a new, in a new country. Amazing. And it was amazing. So we met this, um, this Canadian couple. Uh, they were Parsis, and they'd moved there to live in that town uh, the woman was a scholar of Zoroastrianism, and uh, both of them are very de devout uh, Parsis, and they had moved there to live basically at ground zero for Parsis. And uh, we had a wonderful time chatting with them, but the long and the short of it was that I was not Parsi enough to be allowed entry into the fire temple. <laughs> I, I don't know if it was the hair, or the accent, or my complete and utter lack of knowledge of my own people that gave it away. <laughs> No, actually, that's not quite true. I would have been allowed into the fire temple. I, I would have had, you had to, to have a bath, right? Had to have a cleansing routine. Bathe myself, wear the traditional Parsi uh, sadra and kusti. Sadra is like a thin little, almost uh, linen style shirt. Um, and, um, and the kusti is this sacred thread. And I've said the prayers before I enter the temple. And honestly, when the woman explained it to me, it made complete sense that the idea is before you enter this holy space, you're supposed to cleanse your mind and your body, leave the world behind, so that you can receive, you know, the spirituality of being in a place like that. All right, Parsi story over, back to the cooking. So I'm frying this masala now. Um, and as you can see, it's all incorporated into the onions. And we're minutes away from adding our tomatoes. In fact, we're seconds away from adding the tomatoes I'm gonna do right now. <laughs> tomatoes in. Vish thinks it was the riffraff you were with that disallowed you from going. I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> You were thinking it? <laughs> but, all right. Super and, fun riffraff, I might add. And the cilantro in. So quite often cilantro is used as a garnish, you know, in, in Indian cuisine. It's a little sort of like an herb almost, if you will, right? But in this case, we're using the cilantro almost like you would basil in a, in a tomato sauce. Lots and lots of cilantro. And that's one of the, um, one of the you know, characteristics of this dish is the tomatoes and the cilantro. So you can't go wrong with too much cilantro. Now, of course, if you can't do the cilantro because of the whole, you know, gene thing where it tastes like soap to you, um, then, or poison. That might be slightly out of context for some people. <laughs> you want to explain that? What do you mean? 
the gene oh, well, thing yeah, about I, cilantro. Well, most people that have a problem with cilantro understand why. Um, you know, some of us, not me, me not good, but many people, have uh, some gene in them that essentially um, treats cilantro the same way as you would a poisonous plant, a hemlock or uh, sumac leaves or anything like that, where you instantly feel or your body sort of trained or evolutionary to recognize that it's poisonous. And that gets tripped up with cilantro and people just can't stand cilantro. It just tastes like, uh, I've heard various descriptions of you know, what it does to them, but essentially it's, it's a systemic allergic reaction to your entire brain and your body's saying, don't eat that, it's gonna kill you. Um, so they finally figured it out why it is that some people just hate cilantro. But for the rest of uh, you know, humanity that doesn't have that problem, um, cilantro is just, you know, a much beloved herb. So maligned by some, loved by others, loved by me. I put in everything, stems and all. All right, so now what are we doing? We are now, um, you know, the, uh, the chili is wilting, the green, green chili, but we're gonna let it stay in there and add its heat and flavor to the dish. And this is gonna continue cooking until it turns into almost like a marmalade. Um, and now, from that point forward, we can add a little bit of water if you want a thinner, or we can you know, leave it the way it is if you want it thicker. So, um, one more thing I'm gonna do along the way is salt. All right, so we've got the masala, which is the garlic, the cumin, the red chilies. We got the onions, we got turmeric, we got the tomatoes, we got a little chili in there, and we got lots and lots of cilantro. And you can see how beautiful the green mm -hmm. flat cilantro is there. You know, I almost feel like I want a little bit more cilantro in there. I know it sounds like I'm crazy, but this dish is meant to have really fresh herbaceous flavors of cilantro in there along with all those tomatoes. So just one more little whoop, one more little dice up. And to cut herbs, by the way folks, and I'm sure many of you know this already, but sort of roll it up if you will almost the herb into like a tube. And then whatever you do, don't do what I'm doing. Don't cross cut. Because <laughs> if you cross cut the herbs you bruise them and they uh, they don't look very nice. So make sure you um, just cut one way. And again, because they're herbs, they're gonna kind of fall apart in here, so it doesn't matter if you didn't get a perfect dice on them. You just don't want big, big leafy chunks or big stems in here with your food. All right, guys, look at how beautiful this is. That's fantastic. Tell people for a second about this knife. Um, this is a shun knife. It was... Um, uh, this is not a pitch, by the way. This is no, just the knife again, that he likes. Knife. I've had this for, yeah. Uh, it's a Ken Onion design knife. Ken Onion's a knife maker and designer. So he paired up with Shun, a Japanese knife making company. And if you want to treat yourself to, you know, a really nice kitchen implement, a sharp knife is probably the single best thing you can do for yourself. And a good knife sharpens easily and sharpens well. Spell, so spell the name of that Shun. S-H-U-N. I don't think this, this particular knife is made anymore, but you might still be able to find it online. And it's a Ken Onion design shun. He's designed a lot of knives by them. I forget the actual name of this one. Oh, there it is. It's a DM0500. What I love about it is the angle of the handle is ergonomically correct so that your, arm, your, your wrist is completely flat while dicing. Whereas with a traditional knife that doesn't have that angle to it, I find myself then having to angle my wrist down mm -hmm. to do the, the motion. And that can create you know, a little bit of just a uh, stress on the wrist if you're doing this day in and day out in the kitchen cooking. So, and the knife is just absolutely razor sharp. Just a couple of quick swipes on a, on a steel, and I like keeping a ceramic steel for my knives. Just a couple of quick swipes and ready to go. Um, so Vish is asking about Dana Jiru. Dana Jiru, bay leaves. yes. So Dana Jiru is a combination, wait, what else did he say? Bay leaves. He's asking if you use oh, that in your patia. Yeah. No. No dana, no jiru. Well, sorry, there was jira, there was cumin seeds, uh -huh. but no coriander, no bay leaves. This is kind of the way my mom made it, that I remember her making it. Mm -hmm. And uh, just my, all my childhood memories of the dish are tomatoey, tangy, and a little bit of sweet uh, with lots and lots of fresh cilantro in there. Um, and it's not even meant to be particularly too spicy. Um, I think, I think you could have, you know, we could have easily added more red chilies and that would have made it spicier. I sort of took dollar back a little bit. If you want to, if you like the dish spicy, you can add more. But many parsley dishes aren't actually necessarily spicy. Flavorful, uh, but not They're spicy. flavorful, they have a little bit of heat, but we don't go overboard with the spicy. It's kind of a little bit of that Persian cuisine is still left in our cuisine. Okay, I'm gonna taste this uh, ragu there to see what it's missing. It is so fantastic already! I can't even tell you! He's so excited. I was gonna add a little bit of salt, but then I realized that we have salted our shrimp. 
and our um, with the little bit of masala in there. Um, it's got a little bit of heat. It's got a little bit of heat. I will say that. This chili must have been hotter than I imagined it would be. I'm going to pull it out so Take that, that tri bomb and Ari Irani don't complain. Thank you. About the heat level. And get that out of there. All righty. But I'll just say, when he makes his shrimp patia spicy, I just eat it with extra dal on the and, side. Okay, so, folks, so the best way to enjoy this dish is with some dal. And I actually got some going, a little bit hot. Got some going over here right now. Make that a little stir. It's and comfort food night. Comfort food night. All this is is the red lentils, um, you know, what we call masur dal, with water, salt, and a little bit of uh, turmeric. And I'm going to let it bubble away. And once the dal is sort of almost melted, I'm going to buzz it with a little buzzer. And that's all you need. I mean, if you wanted to, you could add a little garlic in there right, right around the stage to give it a little bit of garlic and flavor. But there's so much flavor in there, you You're just want a bland. simple dal yeah. to do with it. And rice. So someone's asking, how would you make this dish vegetarian? What would you substitute? Just this. Anything anything that, you know, not a vegetarian, um, you know, chunk of choice. <laughs> so whether it's vegetables, uh, or whether it's uh, tofu or tempeh, um, I think it would all go wonderfully in here because 99% of the flavor is in this is in this ragu over here right now. Um, that would be great. I mean, I, I, I'd imagine potatoes would probably be delicious. Yeah, that's what too. I was wondering about. Yeah. yeah. Um, you want something chunky in there? Yeah. Something um, that's going to hold up. Something that's going to hold up. Because it's a strong Exactly. Flavor. So you don't want to add like squash or anything like that or sweet potatoes. You don't want anything that's going to sort of take away from the flavor of this uh, this patia here. Vish is asking about vagar. So Didn't we have this conversation last we time? We did. He's just, he's, just, he's just messing with me right now. <laughs> he's keeping you really busy. He's keeping you busy. All right, guys. So this has really fried. As my mom would say, the oil is separating around the side. The tomatoes have become almost marmalade-y. Some Parsis, some people, anybody might like it at this stage. You just put the shrimp in there, have sort of a thicker dish. I'm going to thin this out just a little bit with hot water. Cool. Why, why, why hot water? So that you don't shock your dish. You don't want to put cold water there and drop the temperature and the cooking all the way down. So kohlrabi already... is what Vish is recommending. Kohlrabi, that's a fantastic. Oh yes, yes, yes. Tell people what kohlrabi is. It's basically uh, like a like a baby cauliflower. I mean, it's a, I don't know if it's in the cauliflower family or not, but um, it's you, yeah. I mean, you know, it looks like a looks like a broccoli and a cauliflower had a love child and with you know lots. You of... find it in an Indian grocery store. If somebody wants for the vegetarian no, no, no. person that's looking for this. No, 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 it's not it's not an Indian it's not an Indian vegetable. You could probably find it at any regular grocery store if it's in if it's in um, um, season. Okay. Vish is saying it has a slightly meaty, fishy texture, so that's why he was recommending it. That's why we have Vish. That's why we that's have our encyclopedia have friend joining us. Alright, so you see how much it thinned up? It's not quite thin. It's still pretty thick, um, but it's this beautiful um, gravy. Okay, so here's the crazy part. This is already sweet and tangy because the tomatoes were just so ripe and delicious. Uh, so traditionally though, there's a little bit more sweet and a little bit more tang put in this, and that comes in through the tamarind and jaggery. So this is what tamarind looks like, and this question has come up before. And it's basically this oh, is Oh, Janet Files question. Yeah, there you go, Janet. It's a block of dried tamarind. You can find this at most Asian grocery stores. Indian grocery stores will have the actual dried stuff. Other Asian grocery stores, like whether it's, you know, Chinese or Thai or Vietnamese or whatever, they usually just call themselves an Asian grocery store, will probably have this more as a soft, wet block, which is perfectly fine also, because that's what we're going to convert this into. And then some places have the tamarind as almost like a sauce in a jar, uh, where it's been pureed and, and liquefied and it's a little bit thinner, and that's fine also. You'll just have to taste it and adjust how much you use when you're cooking this dish. Um, so, the way you, what you do with that block then, is you soak it in hot water. And that's what I did. And when you do, see it softens. So like I was saying, Janet, you might be able to buy it soft like this already as a block. Um, or if this was to be pureed, it would basically turn into almost like a tamarind sauce, if you will. So this is what I've done here. I'm gonna put a little bit of this in this and that. And then also, you know, whatever's left over, I store in a jar, and this is my tamarind left over from the last time I made it. Now, if you don't have tamarind, don't panic. You're looking for acid and sweet. Tamarind has both, but a good substitute would be obviously lime juice and a little bit of brown sugar. So I'm gonna go ahead and put, uh, oopsie, I'm gonna go ahead and put, uh, let's put the older tamarind in first, because, yep, smells great, because we already have it ready. 
and put about two, two tablespoons, two healthy tablespoons. I love the taste of tamarind. If you're not crazy about the taste of tamarind, don't put so much in. What do you and, think the shelf life is for tamarind? Oh, once I've, I mean, in the block like this, forever. Okay. I mean, it's, it's dried essentially. I mean, just, you know, keep it dry. Don't get it damp because then it might get a little moldy. But if you keep it dry, a year plus easily. And then if you um, go ahead and soak it and wet it and put it in the fridge, that thing's been in the fridge. I've been using that for about three, four weeks now. And it's perfectly fine. I would imagine because of the high acid content in the tamarind that it's good for a long time. All right, so that tamarind's in here, and I'm gonna incorporate it well, and I'm gonna add uh, a little bit of brown sugar to get that extra sweetness. Before we do that, let's taste, ah, here we go. Vish is saying Worcestershire can be a good backup too, because it has That's tamarind right. in it. That's right, you mentioned that last time. That was a really good hack. Have a drink, Vish. <laughs> Vish, uh, and have a... Drinking game. Oh! I'm glad I put the tamarind in. I know I said it was already tangy and a little bit of sweet, but that tamarind took the tang to another level. And remember, it's not just about acid. There's just so much fantastic flavor in tamarind that it just uh, made the whole thing. Hmm. Okay, now this is tasting straight up. Straight up. Mom, I don't know if you're watching, but you'd be proud of me. And since uh, we talked about jaggy last time, but since most people can't get their hands on jaggy easily unless you happen to be near an Indian grocery store, um, palm sugar is a good substitute, or just light brown sugar is perfectly fine too. And in here I'm going to put just about a, oh what is this, a sixth of a cup, not much, a couple of tablespoons worth, just to add a little bit of sweet. And what we're doing here is essentially balancing the natural sweetness and tanginess of tomatoes. Um, if your tomatoes are super sweet and super tangy to begin with, you'd want less sugar and less tamarind. If they feel like they need a little bit of that zip and zing, you add a little bit more. And guys, this is ready to be served up with um, seafood of choice. Um, one it, more touch of hot water. Angie West, that. tell Matt to come over and pick up some for dinner. Angie's getting one hungry watching water. this. And guys, we are done. How's our timing? We're four minutes past the time. Didn't break the record. Didn't break the prior record, but I think it was worth the extra steps here of showing you guys how to do this properly. All right, and now all you have to do is put in your seafood of choice. Prawn, or shrimp in this case, is the OG choice for the Parsis. Um, and in we go with that. Give it a stir for a couple of minutes. This is gonna cook literally in minutes. As soon as the shrimps look pink, they're done. The sauce may thicken a little bit, and just tweak, tweak, tweak the amount of ratio of water to shrimp to sauce. I'm gonna give it one more tweak, guys, with just a touch more water in here. I don't want it too thick, but also don't want it too thin. I don't want to have all those flavors kind of get uh, diluted. So I'm just balancing this careful, instead of adding the equivalent of a quarter cup at a time, uh, putting the shrimp in, thicken the gravy a little bit also, and. Um, before you sign off, do you have any tricks for keeping your pots from getting turmeric stained? Well, a good pot, if it's, um, you know, even if it's uh, enameled or coated, it's not going to get turmeric stained. The stainless steel, aluminum, turmeric's not going to stain that. It's not going to steel. It's not going to stain a non porous surface. Um, so it may stain your uh, cooking utensils, especially if you use wood or, or <laughs> white silicone. But I don't know, honey. I mean, we've done pretty it good with this. It does come off it eventually. Come off. Right. I use this all the time, and it's, it sort of seems to have come off. All right, folks. We're almost done. The shrimp are getting pink and cooked. And this What do is, you usually serve this with? So, we talked about this a little bit, but I would serve this with rice and dal. If you don't want to do the rice, if you want to stay um, low carb, just a pinch more salt. All right, guys, we are done. Let's, uh, what should we put this in? Check honey, mom, let's see. What this is have. ultimate comfort food. I just want to say this, this has been quite a week living in America. This is a rough week and we all need some comfort food at the end of it. So that's what we're having. Well said. It's been a rough week. There's a lot going on. Uh, a lot of feelings, a lot of tensions, a lot of shit going down sometimes it feels like. But um, I think it's important at a time like this to focus on the things that bring joy instead of focusing on the things that bring 
sort of negativity and, and just um, you know feelings of frustration and stress. I mean, those feelings are unavoidable. And I love cooking, and I think that the very act of cooking and serving someone you love food, um, it's one of the ultimate expressions of food. I mean, eating communally. <laughs> the ultimate expressions of love. Of love. <laughs> and of food. It's an expression of food, too. It's an expression of food. But I think there's nothing quite as human as eating communally. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the most basic things we do, um, is to eat communally as people. So, hope you guys get a chance to cook some food tonight. Mm -hmm. um, share it with your loved ones. Uh, play with it, experiment with it. Let cooking bring joy, not stress. I mean, you can tell how happy and excited I'm about cooking because I just love the experimentation of food. It's all right if you screw up. You're just gonna make it better next time. And, and, and you're gonna have confidence that when you screw up, that you will recognize sometimes that, oh, it's not so hard to fix this. And I know what to do right the next time. Um, so let's put this in a bowl before it gets overdone. And you can always taste it when somebody's making food with love. You feel it. You feel it. You taste Absolutely. it in the food. Mom, you'd be so proud of this dish. <laughs> you really would be. All right, guys. This is what it looks like. Scoop some up to serve. Mm, I'm just going to go ahead and fill this dish up, put a lid on it, put it in the dining table. And I hope you are hungry, honey. I'm hungry. We got shrimp in here and we gotta eat this sucker. Where are you gonna post this recipe for those people that didn't catch all the details? Spicewellerbrand.com will be where the recipe is and the actual video itself will be available on both Spicewellers channel and an uh, Instagram channel, and on my Instagram channel, at Marwanawani, at Spicewalla, and a little nest of cilantro on the top, and voila, shrimp patio. Beautiful. All right, guys. Great cooking for you, as always. I think I got one more Saturday in me before this hair goes away. <laughs> uh, Bish, you and I got to talk about the auction for the hair. Um, <laughs> I don't think they want your hair itself. I think they want to see the hair. <laughs> They might want the hair. I mean, good guy, you can stuff a small animal with this thing. Small teddy bear with this thing. Uh, but this has been fun. Check my mom. Thanks for handling the camera. Thanks, you guys, for watching. Recipe will be up, uh, hopefully, by the end of the day on the website. But I really try to make it to where you guys can follow along and see what I was doing and show how easy and simple the dishes to make at home with ingredients that hopefully you already have. If you don't have those spices, go to your nearest grocery store. Or if you want to shop online, go to SpiceWallerBrand.com, and we will ship it to you. Packed with love from Asheville, North Carolina. Bye, everybody. Bye. Mmm.